Welcome everyone to our next webinar in our Learn at Home series offered by the University of Rhode Island College of the Environment and Life Sciences and more specifically Cooperative Extension, um, which is who I am here representing. My name is Kate Mentorini. I am an Extension Educator at URI. Um, really pleased to bring you a great webinar with my colleague, Dr. Bridget Rumley, who is a professor at URI. She's gonna talk with us about easy lawn care. Next slide, please. So we're really um, grateful and happy you all are here, uh, whether you're here live or listening via YouTube later on. Um, this webinar is brought to you by Cooperative Extension, which is I think one of the um, coolest parts of the University of Rhode Island. Our um, goal at URI is to bring science-based resources out to Rhode Islanders to help them solve problems. We do that in a number of different ways, and um, we've been offering this Learn at Home webinar series while we're all home um, in an effort to get information out to people around our um, areas of focus, which include things on the slide here, land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy, and healthy lifestyles. Um, we are also, you can go ahead one slide, we're um, also pleased to offer this information to you via webinar because one of the things we are um, really committed to um, that we believe is very important is making sure that science is accessible by everyone. And one of the great things about the internet is that it takes away the need to get into some form of transportation and travel somewhere to get information. So these webinars have been an amazing um, uh, kind of new way for us to make sure that we're able to help folks all throughout Rhode Island and different communities improve their quality of life and their livelihoods and hopefully the health of our natural environment by um, giving you access to science-based information to help you solve, in the case tonight, lawn problems. Um, so I'll also just mention that um, we believe in social justice and we are working actively to um, deepen our cultural understanding and build capacity to, uh, to create inclusive experiences that address all um, different types of stakeholder need um, as they vary from person to person. And so our ears are always open. Um, we do have a Facebook page and an Instagram page. We have a YouTube channel. Um, we have an email address and I'll share all of that with you. But I, um, I guess I would just say we encourage you all to reach out if there's something you would like to learn more about and you don't see anything offered on our website or on our social media pages, please reach out and we'll see how we can help you. Next slide. So um, just a couple housekeeping items. We um, will email those of you who are here live. There's um, a link to a brief survey. The reason we give a survey is because we actually read your responses and we use them to determine to evaluate whether or not um, our educational programming is helping you do something differently in your life. And that is a measure of success for us in extension. So thank you very much for taking a minute or two to just complete that brief survey that we email to you. And also if you have friends and family, um, neighbors who are not able to be here with us tonight, please direct them to our YouTube channel. It's very easy to find, just put URI Cooperative Extension in uh, the YouTube search and you'll find our Learn at Home series bookmarked there. Um, all of these webinars are uploaded within a week after they're offered once we're able to close caption them to make sure that um, everybody can access the information. So um, thanks again for doing the survey and for spreading the word about our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will introduce um, again, my colleague, Dr. Rumley, who, um, is a professor uh, in the Department of Plant Sciences and Entomology at URI. She earned her master's and PhD degrees in horticulture, um, emphasizing turf grass improvement from the University of Minnesota, where it's probably a lot colder than it is here in the winter. Um, 
and Bridget has conducted research extension and um, teaching in turf grass management at URI since 1991. So we are very lucky um, and thankful to her for taking her Tuesday night out to share the information with us. Um, so Bridget, take it away and thank you again. Okay, thank you, Kate. It's nice to have everybody here. I wish I could see your faces, but we'll we'll do the best we can without being able to see everybody. We're going to talk about lawns and easy ways to take care of them. And the first question some people have is what do I use for my lawn? And when they hear the word turf grasses, the next question is, well, what are turf grasses? Well, turf grasses are a certain group of grasses that can be regularly mown without them being killed. And so they will continue to grow even after they've been repeatedly mown. Most of the turf grasses we use are considered perennial, even though individual grass stems usually only live about one year. So how do turf grasses stay perennial? Well, before the plant produces seed, it makes vegetative daughter plants that will continue the life of the turf. And if the daughter plants are from the main growing point, which is called a crown, crowns are located at the base of the plant or toward the base of the plant, or they may also produce daughter plants from above ground stems called stolons or from below ground stems called rhizomes. And so I'll be mentioning stolons and rhizomes as I talk about some of the turf grasses during this presentation. So a lot of people think there's nothing good for turf if they don't have a reason to be playing on it, but turf actually helps cool your area around your home. Turf grasses also help improve turf qual air quality and they actually provide oxygen, just like other plants provide oxygen during the process of making food. Turf grasses, when they are nice and dense and healthy, can help reduce erosion and keep soil from being washed away. Also, they help reduce noise. Imagine walking on a sidewalk versus walking on turf grasses, and it's much quieter walking on a turf grass. They also provide lots of space for recreation, and they do provide an aesthetic appeal for people who like to have a background for their lovely landscape plants in their home lawn situations. They've also been shown to improve mental health. That's true for all plants, actually, that being able to look at these nice living organisms makes you feel more alive. So when we talk about grasses that we grow in the north, I'm talking about generally the northern half of the United States and particularly here in New England. The four main types that you probably might consider for your home lawn would be Kentucky bluegrass, a group of different grass species known as fine fescues, a turf type tall fescue, and perennial rye grasses. So what are these types of grasses? Well, Kentucky bluegrass which has a scientific name, Poa pretensis. You may wonder why it has this fancy scientific name. That's because when you go anywhere in the world, if you call something Kentucky bluegrass, they may not know what you're talking about. But if you say Poa pretensis, they will know exactly what you're talking about. Whenever I ask my students where they think Kentucky bluegrass is native to, they invariably will say Kentucky when actually they're from Europe. So if you go over to Europe, they call bluegrasses meadow grass instead of Kentucky bluegrass. So that's why I've included scientific names. So in case you go elsewhere in the world and want to talk about one of these grasses, you've got a name that you can use. So Kentucky bluegrass is the most commonly used cool season turf grass in home lawns. And one of the reasons is because they have those underground stems called rhizomes and rhizomes will enable lawns to recover faster from stress. Buds that are on these underground stems will produce new daughter plants to fill in bare areas. Now, Kentucky bluegrasses do best in the full sun. There are different named cultivars or varieties of Kentucky bluegrass that may tolerate some light shade, but they will do best in full sun. That's why we often mix Kentucky bluegrass with other kinds of grasses that do a little bit better in the shade 
so that you've got grasses that will survive in the different kinds of sunny and shady locations in your yard. Kentucky bluegrasses are divided into common versus elite types. Most of the cultivars available to you today will probably be elite types. Common types tend not to be as fancy looking, I guess would be one way to put it, but they often have a little bit better drought resistance compared to some of the elite types. There are many named cultivars of Kentucky bluegrass and what is available in your area will depend upon what your local supplier may carry or what you may be able to find on the internet for sale. And the differences among these different cultivars, they do have variable water and fertility requirements. They also have different shades of green. Some of them are very light green. Some of them are very dark green. Some of them tolerate drought a little bit better than others. And some of them will tolerate a lower mowing height than others. So there's a lot of variability among Kentucky bluegrass cultivars. They tend to be a medium to dark green leaf color among the cultivars we like here in the United States. And they've got sort of an intermediate leaf texture. When we talk about leaf texture, we're talking about how wide the leaves are. What you want to have for the best healthy lawn is to have good density of turf grass plants. And Kentucky bluegrass probably provides the best density of all the grasses we're going to talk about today. One of the downsides is they do have a tendency to produce a fair amount of thatch. And we'll talk about thatch a little bit later. A little bit of thatch is good. Too much thatch can be detrimental to your lawn. So we'll just put that on the back burner for the moment. Kentucky bluegrasses have a genetic ability to go dormant during drought periods. So where it may look like your lawn is dying, if you have mostly Kentucky bluegrass, it's probably just going dormant until enough moisture comes around that it can revive. It would only be in a really extreme drought period that you might actually lose the grass entirely. But those underground stems, the rhizomes, will have food reserves that can help the Kentucky bluegrass recover once the drought is passed. Now, the fine fescues include several species of grasses. Kentucky bluegrass was one species of grass. In the fine fescues, these are grasses that have very narrow leaves. That's why we call them fine, not that they're greater than anything else. The two that have the best spreading ability are creeping red fescues. And there are strong creeping red fescues and slender creeping red fescues. Both of them do help provide good shade tolerance, as do all of the fine fescues. Other fine fescues you may hear about are chewing's fescue, hard fescue, sheep fescue, and blue fescue. Of these, chewing's fescue and hard fescue do best in a lawn mixture. A lawn mixture contains grass seed of more than one species. So in a typical lawn mixture in New England, you would have some Kentucky bluegrass and you would have one or more of the fine fescues. The sheep fescue and the blue fescue, they do not spread as readily as the other fescues, and they probably would be better used as ornamental plants in your, your gardens rather than being included in a lawn mixture. So creeping red fescues are creeping because they have rhizomes. Their rhizomes are not as vigorous as Kentucky bluegrass rhizomes, but they will help areas where the lawn is more shaded to recover when damage does occur. The other species I mentioned are all bunch type grasses, which means they mostly produce daughter plants from the crowns. And so they do not spread to fill in damage quite as well as some of the other creeping types. As I mentioned, fine refers to the narrowness of the leaves and fine fescues have a fairly narrow leaf. Some have a very, very narrow leaf, almost resembling pine needles. And all fine fescues have both shade and drought tolerance. So if you have a lawn that's got trees, it's got buildings where sometimes of the day there's a fair amount of shade, your best chance of having grass survive there would be having some fine fescue. Fine fescues also tolerate lower moisture than many of the other grasses that we grow. And they also tolerate lower fertility. So they're a fairly low maintenance grass. 
Now, if you mix them with Kentucky bluegrass, there are some Kentucky bluegrass cultivars that are considered lower maintenance than other cultivars. So if you want a truly low maintenance lawn, selecting the right cultivars of the different grasses can make your life a lot easier. Unfortunately, they're not great for areas where there's a lot of traffic. So they do not have a lot of wear tolerance when there's a lot of foot traffic on them. So that's why you want a mixture of grasses. The Kentucky bluegrass has the better wear tolerance and will stand up to children playing on the yard or the family football game after a Thanksgiving meal. Now, tall fescue is a slightly different species. It is not as narrow leaved as the fine fescues. It is usually considered a bunch type grass, although some of the newer cultivars do have short rhizomes. And they have a fairly good leaf color. And one way to tell them from the Kentucky bluegrass is that they have a shiny underside. Now, tall fescues were developed from forage type tall fescues, which are used to feed animals and have very wide leaves. Turf type tall fescues have narrower leaves, so they blend in better with other grasses. Tall fescue also prefers germinating at a warmer temperature. So if you're going to use a tall fescue in your lawn and you want to seed it, you're going to have to seed it earlier in the season than you would some of the other turf grasses that I've talked about. So why might you like tall fescue? It's got fairly good wear tolerance, but if you do have a lot of excess traffic on it, and it does reach a point where damage occurs, you're going to have to overseed that area to get the grass to grow back in because it does not have as good a recovery potential like Kentucky bluegrass has. Now, tall fescue tolerates the highest heat of all the grasses I've mentioned, but they're the least cold tolerant of these turf grasses, which are known as cool season turf grasses. Interestingly, while Tall fescue is often touted as being drought tolerant. It actually requires more water than many of the other grasses. And it is able to be drought tolerant because it is able to send down deeper roots to get to water sources that some of the other turf grasses are not able to get to. So if you have shallow soils, you may have a problem trying to keep tall fescue growing because it may not be able to reach deeper water sources. To give you an idea of the difference between turf type tall fescue and fine fescue as far as leaf width, the turf type tall fescue is on the left, the fine fescue is on the right. That happens to be a, a creeping red fescue that you see there. It looks a little bit light green in color, but there are other fine fescues that are darker green. So don't panic that if you have fine fescues, you're going to have a yellow green lawn. Now, another grass that's often in a mixture with Kentucky bluegrass and fine fescues when you seed a new lawn is something called perennial ryegrass. And perennial ryegrass is a bunch type grass. It doesn't have stolons or rhizomes, so it doesn't have the ability to spread very readily. But what it does have is that it has a fairly moderate to rapid growth. It also has a fairly rapid germination. So when you seed a new lawn, it's typical to have a small percent of perennial ryegrass in your seed mixture, which will germinate the fastest and provide some initial ground cover until the Kentucky bluegrass and the fine fescues, which are slower to germinate, can come up and fill in that area. Perennial ryegrasses are fairly good color as far as their greenness. That picture you see is very representative of a typical color of perennial ryegrass. Like tall fescue, they are shiny on the undersides of their leaves. Like Kentucky bluegrass, they don't tolerate a lot of shade. Their primary use in a typical lawn mixture is to provide initial ground cover when you're first germinating the grass. They generally don't have the greatest drought tolerance either. So in an extended drought, they probably will end up dying out and the bluegrass and the fescues will fill in the density that's lost to the perennial ryegrasses. 
while they are existing in your lawn, they do have fairly good wear tolerance. They are used quite frequently on athletic fields along with Kentucky bluegrass. They are slow to recover from damage when they do become worn out. So if you have perennial ryegrass as a large part of your mixture, you would have to expect to overseed it probably on a regular basis, similar to what you might have to do with tall fescue. That's why many people prefer the Kentucky bluegrass as the main component of their lawn mixtures. And even though it's got perennial in the name, perennial ryegrasses are generally not as long lasting as other perennial species. And so eventually in an older lawn, you might find it very difficult to find any perennial ryegrass if you've not been overseeding it on a regular basis. But it does provide that initial ground cover that helps reduce erosion when you're first establishing your lawn. Now, people have asked the garden hotline about lower maintenance lawns that may include clover. Clover is a legume and legumes are plants that have an association with the bacterium that can pull nitrogen from the air and make it available to the plant. So the clovers actually are much lower fertility than the turf grasses. And there are some places now that are providing blends of turf grasses and clover, or you can take your lawn and incorporate clover seed into it. The pros and cons of clover are that you will get a better benefit of the nitrogen that is brought from the air and made available to the clover. It is also made available to the turf grasses, so you can reduce your fertilization. So in addition to that benefit of the increased nitrogen, clovers also increase the drought tolerance of your lawn. And on average, that association with the bacterium that pulls nitrogen from the air and turns it into a form that the plants can use, you get about two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet annually. And for your basic home lawn, that's enough to keep your lawn going quite well. Also, you tend to have a decrease in, in some disease infestations because there are more pest predators. Those are the beneficial pests that will attack various different organisms that we consider harmful to our lawns in general. They also will attract bees. So if you're allergic to bees or you like to run around barefoot when the bees are out pollinating the flowers, you may need to be a little bit more careful and may not want to have a high clover lawn. But the clover does help keep the lawn more dense. And so you'll have a decrease in weeds that you may not want in your lawn by having the clover present to outcompete any other plants that might try and enter your lawn. The hotline also gets questions about zoysia grasses, and so I'm going to briefly mention them. Zoysia grasses are what we call warm season grasses. They grow best where temperatures are much warmer than here in the Northeast or any part of the Northern United States. There are different species of zoysia grasses, the three most common ones that are used are listed here, Japanese lawn grass, which is sometimes called Korean lawn grass, Manila grass, and mascarine grass. Japanese lawn grass is what the top picture looks like. And the Manila grass, the mascarine grass, that's what lawns that have those species look like. Only the Japanese lawn grass would have a chance of surviving the winters in the northern part of the United States. The manila grass and the mascarine grass, they would die out. So Japanese lawn grasses, where some people use them, they like them because they've got a decent appearance to their leaf. They have a fairly good color and they are very aggressive at filling in an area. Some of the older cultivars are slow to establish, but the newer ones do establish faster. The thing is that these stolons and rhizomes tend to be fairly aggressive and they will grow over anything in their way. So if you have a neighbor who prizes their Kentucky bluegrass lawn, you may want to 
be careful about introducing Japanese lawn grass. Because it is a warm season grass, it does not green up until temperatures are greater than 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the spring, and it'll be go, begin to go dormant when temperatures start to fall, fall below 70 degrees in the fall. As I mentioned, it does not mix with other grasses, and while it tolerates less mowing, its leaves are so tough that it often dulls your mower blades faster than any other turf grass species. So it is a different kind of grass to grow. The only place where you might consider it is if you have a summer home that you're only at in the summertime and you don't want to have to worry about it when you're not there, it might be an option for you. However, again, be careful about whether or not it might go to your neighbors who may not appreciate that lawn grass. Some people have asked how to get rid of it. There are some herbicides that will selectively take it out that don't harm the cool season grasses. You always need to check herbicide labels. They may change over time and you only apply herbicides in the amounts that they are labeled for. Another option is to kill all of your grass outright to get rid of the zoysia grass and then replant the entire area. So when is the best time to establish a lawn? Generally, for most of our turf grasses, fall is the best time for seeding, most of them. Tall fescue is an exception. If you cannot do it early enough in the fall, the next best suggestion is to plant it in the spring. For the other turf grasses, spring would be the next best time to plant them. The reason fall is the best time is that plants have the fall and the spring seasons to become established before the onset of the heat of our summer stress, which we're fortunate we haven't had excessive heat like they've had in other parts of the country yet, but it's probably going to come. An alternative to establishing from seed is sodding. And sod can be laid down throughout the year, although just like with lawn seed, fall and spring are the best times to get a good establishment of a sodded lawn. So when you decide you're going to start a new lawn, the first thing you want to do is get a soil test. You will get an evaluation of the nutrient content of the soil as well as the pH. That's how acid or basic your soil is. In New England, we tend to have acid soils. So most likely a soil test will come back with the result that you probably need to add some lime to increase the pH. While you're waiting for the soil test to come back, you can start preparing your ground. And ground preparation in includes several steps of tilling, smoothing the surface into rough grades and finished grades of what you want the final appearance to be. Preferentially, you want to till down to at least a depth of 6 to 12 inches. Here in New England, you're often restricted to a much lower root zone because we just do not have deep soils like they have in other parts of the country. But you wanna try and get as deep a root zone as possible because your plants will have the best opportunity to obtain water and nutrients with the deeper the root zone you can get. Once you get your soil test back, you should incorporate whatever lime and nutrients that are recommended to bring your soil up to a better health for your, your grass. Generally, that's done by tilling in the recommended materials throughout the entire root zone. You may also want to add some soil amendments like compost or other organic matter to increase the organic matter of your soil. Just before you seed, you may decide to add a starter fertilizer. That's a very low application it's usually about a half a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And that just helps the germinating grass to get going. You don't want to go with any higher of a rate because you can burn the new seedlings if you use too much fertilizer. So if you decide to establish by seed, you want to accurately measure the area of your lawn to determine the amount of seed needed. And the amount of seed needed will depend upon the grass seed you pick because the different grass species have different seed sizes. The places where you buy the seed will have indications on their package mixes about 
how much to apply of the different seeds, depending upon the area you've determined you have. What you want to do is split the seed into two parts and apply the seed in two directions. This will give you a more uniform coverage. Once you've applied the seed, it would be good to rake or drag lightly to just partially cover the seed. Grass seeds need light to germinate, so you don't want to bury the seed too deeply, but you do want to ensure that the seed is in good contact with the soil. If you have the ability to have a roller, use a roller without any water in it to firm the soil. That just increases the contact of the seed with the soil and ensures that you will have the most optimum conditions for germinating seed. If you are worried about keeping the surface moist, you may apply mulch. You don't have to apply mulch if you're going to be able to keep the surface uniformly moist until the grass has germinated. If you do apply mulch, make sure you remove some of it as the grass starts to grow so that it does not smother the grass that's trying to emerge. Initially, you want to water frequently and lightly, and you want to keep the surface inch or so moist. What you want to do as the grass starts to grow is to gradually reduce the frequency, but increase the amount of water that you're applying so the water goes deeper into the soil. What you're trying to do at this point is you're trying to encourage the grass to grow roots as deeply as possible. So those roots will only grow as deep as there is water, which is why you need to increase the depth of the water as the grass plants start to grow. If you decide to use sod, you want to roll it out within 24 hours of delivery, if at all possible. That sod, when it's rolled up, is still going through all of its metabolic processes and it's generating heat. And excess heat within that rolled up roll of sod can kill the grass. So the sooner you can lay it and roll it out, the better. What you want to do is lay the sod in a brick-like fashion with the ends not all ending in the same part. That way your lawn will blend in more uniformly faster than if you had a whole line of the ends of the rolls all lined up in one, one spot. Do not stretch the sod. It will spring back and then you will have gaps. If you find you have some small gaps, even if you've not stretched the sod, what you want to do is, is take some soil and fill in those small gaps so that the ends of the sod rolls don't dry out. And what you want to do is don't leave any open seams or those edges. And when I say top dress, that's what I mean by applying some soil to fill in those spaces so that the turf grass can have a moist area to fill in and not dry out. Again, you can use a roller that's not got any water in it to make good sod to soil contact. You don't want to use too heavy of a roller or it can actually pull the sod away from the surface. So it's just one to sort of make sure that there aren't any humps that were left when you were trying to be so careful not to stretch the sod. You do want to water thoroughly. You generally water deeper and less frequently than for a new seeding because you've already got established turf grass. And what you want to do is start promoting root development as fast as possible. And so by having a deeper watering depth initially, that will encourage those roots to grow down faster. If you're in an area where the sod producers are able to produce what we call large sod rolls, you may be able to get a lawn with very few seams because large sod rolls can be produced where you have a piece of sod that can be four feet wide and several feet long compared to conventional sod that each roll is one foot by nine feet. So you can talk about dozens of feet in a single roll of a large roll versus nine square feet in a single roll of conventional sod. Now that you've got your lawn established, you want to keep traffic to a minimum for six weeks. That applies whether you're talking about seeding or sodding. 
Even though a sodded lawn looks like it's instantly ready to use, you do need to give it time to send those roots down into the ground and get it to adhere to the location. The time when you need to mow is when the turf reaches a height that it would normally be mown. And we're gonna talk about mowing height shortly. So you don't need to wait till the grass is a foot long. You actually wanna mow it when you normally would mow an established lawn. So lawns grow best when they're maintained at usually a height of about two to three inches. Move more than a third of the vegetation with each mowing. Mowing is a stress on the grass and it will respond by trying to grow new plants as well as growing and extending the leaf blades. So if you want to cut your lawn to a two inch height, you would mow it when it is no greater than three inches in height, preferentially. Now during stress periods, you want to consider raising the mower height a half inch or maybe even an inch because that will reduce evaporation from the soil surface. Also that higher mowing height will help shade the soil and reduce weed seed germination. So while you can mow lawns closer than two inches, it is enough of a stress that you probably will see more weeds start to come in when you go much below two inches with the grasses that I've talked about today. Also the higher mowing heights allow for deeper roots to develop and the deeper roots can help improve drought resistance and drought tolerance in the grasses that you've planted. Also a higher mowing height allows the grasses to resist diseases more effectively. Every time you mow, you have a cut surface that diseases can enter. And so the less frequently you're able to mow, the less frequently you'll have cut surfaces for diseases to get into your grasses. Two basic kinds of mowers are the real mower on the left and the rotary mower on the right. The real mower cuts like a scissors. It provides the finest and nicest cut, but it also requires that you be more conscientious with your mowing. Anytime the grass gets higher than half the height of that orange reel, it's not going to cut properly. And the blades will actually just kind of mush through the mower. What happens is that orange blade spins around and when it gets to the bottom, it comes in contact with another blade called a bed knife. And between that real blade and the bed knife, you get a cutting action like a scissors. The rotary mower has the blade spinning around horizontally, and it basically hacks off the grass like a knife. So the more frequently you're able to keep that blade sharpened, the better your grass cut will be. If you mow with a very dull blade, you're gonna end up with very jagged leaf edges and that's gonna be more prone to disease problems. So you always wanna make sure that your blades are sharp. Now, if you are using a rotary mower, consider making sure that you have a mulching mower. A mulching mower is one where the blade is curved in such a way that the grass clippings get rotated underneath that mower deck multiple times so they're cut into smaller pieces than with a conventional mowing blade. Also leave your clippings on the lawn. Even if you don't use a rotary mower, those clippings do not contribute significantly to thatch that we'll talk about shortly. And those clippings provide nutrients to the remaining turf grass. So they also help reduce the need for adding supplemental fertilization. Here's the difference in rotary mower clippings from a conventional rotary mower on the left and a mulching mower on the right. The finer the clippings are cut, the faster they're going to disappear and be less noticeable on your lawn. Grass blades are mostly water. So within a few days, they're gonna be pretty much dried up and the finer pieces will settle down inside in between your turf grass leaves that are remaining much faster if you've got a mulching mower. And as I mentioned, these grass clippings provide slow release nutrients as they decompose. 
And so they're equivalent to generally at least a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. <clears throat> now, when you mow, make sure you keep the grass off paved surfaces. Grass blades, because they have nutrients in them, you do not want them to go into your waterways. Sweep them off the hard surfaces back onto the lawn, or if you have a compost pile, you can add them to your compost pile. Do not allow those grass clippings to go down street drains. They can reach waterways, and that helps to make waterways less beneficial for other life that exists in those water systems. Now, as far as managing soil over time, you can add compost as long as it's herbicide free. Some herbicides that may be used on other landscape plants may not be good for lawn grasses. And some herbicides that are used on lawn grasses may not be good for other landscape plants. So if you're going to add any plant material to your compost pile, make sure it's plant material that does not have any herbicides on them. Some herbicides can last for a year or more. So you would have to wait that amount of time before you'd be able to use your compost and feel fairly confident that you aren't going to kill whatever you're applying it to. But compost does add organic matter to your lawn and organic matter is useful in helping conserve moisture as well as helping retain some nutrients, which is beneficial for turf grass growth. You want to monitor your soil pH and monitoring your soil pH means checking it every two to three years at least if you have your own pH meter, you can take test it more frequently, but you don't have to do it every week by any means. It's, it's something that can be done every couple years. It's a good idea to maintain consistent soil fertility. So by leaving the clippings, by having some clover in the lawn, you have a more consistent fertility than if you are constantly applying supplemental fertilization. Doesn't mean you shouldn't apply supplemental fertilization, but with these other steps, you can reduce that supplemental fertilization. You do wanna prevent soil compaction. Plant roots need air in order to function properly. So you need to have some air space in the space between your soil particles. If you can reduce or eliminate synthetic chemicals, it just, is healthier for your lawn if, if you've got a nice healthy dense lawn using the most minimum supplemental addition of products. So as far as fertilization, you should test your soil every one to two years. And many states have agricultural experiment stations that have soil testing labs that can do your soil test samples for a reasonable price. Unfortunately, Rhode Island no longer has that ability, but you can still send soil tests to UMass and UConn. If you look on the picture on the upper right, you see some numbers. Every bag must have those three numbers or three numbers of some type. The first number, the 22, tells the percent nitrogen that's in that bag. The middle number, in this example, is zero. That tells the percent phosphorus in the bag. And the third number tells the percent of potassium in the bag. These are three of the most essential elements that plants need. And they're the ones that plants are most likely to be missing from the soil. And a soil test will tell you how much of each of those you may need to add to make your soil in a better condition for your turf grass growth. You wanna fertilize when the turf is actively growing. You do not want to fertilize if it is dormant. That grass won't be able to take up that fertilizer and it may actually increase the stress on the turf. Early fall is the best time if you're making just one application of fertilizer. Generally, home lawns don't need more than three to four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Now, with that, if you've got your grass clippings left on, and maybe you have some clover in your lawn, 
you may get by with as little as one application a year. In that case, the early fall may be the only time you need to do it. You don't want to put down more than one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet in a single application. Preferably use slow release fertilizers because that will spread out the release of the fertilizer and give a more consistent response of the grass to the fertilizer. It also keeps the fertilizer from being leached through the root zone and getting to your groundwater. If you do decide to make additional applications of fertilizer, and again, don't go down more than one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, late fall, usually around the time of Halloween, up to maybe Thanksgiving, and early spring are the next best times. If you want to spread out your applications and apply a half pound in the early fall, you could apply a half pound in late fall and possibly again another half pound the following spring. Preferentially organic fertilizers or microbial slow release synthetic fertilizers are recommended. They provide the most consistent release of fertilizer to your lawn. So you don't get a real fast green up and then the grass turns yellower as it loses the ability to take up more nitrogen. You want to adjust your pH based on your soil test results. Most grasses grow best between a pH of six to seven. Seven is considered a neutral pH. That's basically drinking water. And why pH is important is that the plants are able to take up nutrients in varying amounts at different pH levels. And for optimum nutrient uptake, a pH range of six to seven is best. If your lawn looks healthy and you are returning your clippings when you mow, you may find that you don't need to fertilize every year. It all depends upon how your turf looks to you and what kind of appearance you want it to have. Two kinds of spreaders are typically used in applying fertilizer. The drop spreader on the left provides a better control of overall fertilizer placement, but the rotary spreader on the right is often used because you can cover a wider stretch in each pass. The problem is that the fertilizer, if it's got different densities, it may not spread uniformly away from that impeller that the fertilizer hits as it drops out of the fertilizer pan. If you do have some narrow areas, using a drop spreader is really preferred. It doesn't do any good to try and fertilize the sidewalk. It's not gonna grow any grass there. And that fertilizer on the sidewalk will probably just get washed down the drain. So in those cases, a drop spreader will give you better control of where the fertilizer is going. That being said, you do need to be careful about where you are going with the drop spreader because you need to keep track of where you've been and where you need to go, or you might end up with a lawn that's striped rather than a uniform green. Here's an example of lawns that have not been fertilized, and then once they've been fertilized, how much better they can look. So proper fertilization can make turf more dense and more pest resistant, as well as greener. And that Denser turf will actually keep more weed seed from germinating. What you want to avoid is excess fertilization, especially of nitrogen. Excess fertilization results in greater thatch development that we'll talk about shortly. It also makes your grass more attractive to insects that will come feed on it. And it also makes it more attractive for diseases to spread. In addition, any nitrogen the plants aren't able to take up before the water moves past the root zone, that nitrogen will be carried down into the groundwater. And excess nitrogen in the groundwater is not good for drinking. Excess nitrogen at a high enough level may actually result in burned areas like you see in the picture here. Now, during the growing season, cool season grasses require about an inch of moisture per week to stay green. And that includes any amounts that might come from rainfall and or irrigation. 
The best time to water is early morning. That gives the longest time of the day for those leaves to dry. If you water later in the day and the leaves go into the night when it's wet, that gives you a better chance of diseases developing overnight and stressing your turf. You want to make sure you apply the water slowly enough that it does not run off. If you have a well-managed soil, you may be able to apply the entire inch at one watering. So once a week is preferable, but if you have a soil that does not take the water in fairly well, you may need to split the watering into a couple different applications. What you want to ensure is that you're, you're getting water that goes into the soil and doesn't run off your turf. Also, if you are using some kind of irrigation, you want to make sure you don't allow water onto non-plant areas. It's a waste of water and anything that might be on those surfaces can get carried down into your drains. So I've mentioned thatch a couple times. What is thatch? Well, in the diagram or the picture you see, the grass blades are what you see when you look at your lawn. At the base or toward the base of those leaves is the growing point of the plant. That's the crown. And where the crown is located, you start to find the thatch layer. And the thatch layer is composed of dead and dying stems and roots mostly. Very little amount of leaf clippings contribute to thatch. And this thatch, if your soil is somewhat dry, it will feel kind of prickly like straw. And if your soil is wet, it will feel spongy. And the roots will be growing primarily in your soil. So in this example, this thatch is about one and a half inches thick, and that's actually making it harder for your lawn to do well. Now, the reason I said leaves do not contribute much to thatch is because they're easily broken down by microbes. The materials that make up leaves are not as difficult for microbes to break down as the materials that are in stems and roots. So about a half inch of thatch is desirable to protect those crowns that are growing at the base of your plants. If you get thatch greater than an inch, you should consider reducing the thatch by either aerification or vertical mowing. I'll talk about aerification in a moment. Vertical mowing is using a mower with special blades that rotate vertically, that literally chop through the grass and pull out some of the thatch which then you have to rake up off of your turf. Another reason you might consider aerification is if you have some soil compaction. If your soils contained a lot of clay, they will compact more easily than if your soils have more sand in them. And the difference between a compacted clay soil and a top soil that contains less clay is shown in this picture here. And so the compacted soil clay is a more difficult growing environment for the plant roots. And so your plants do get stressed and suffer more. Heavily trafficked areas are the ones most likely to become trafficked or compacted first. And the best way to alleviate compaction is to use a hollow tine core aerifier. Now there are other means that are used for opening up soil, but hollow tine aerifiers provide the best way to reduce that soil compaction. Now, you may have seen those lovely devices on the left you can strap on your feet. They will provide openings into the soil to allow some water and fertilizer infiltration, but they really will not help reduce compaction as well as if you use a machine like the one pictured in the middle. That machine is a core aerifier, and the person is holding some of those cores or plugs that are pulled out of your turf. If you have a lot of thatch, you may need to go over your lawn several times to pull out a lot of, that, a lot of the plugs. If the plugs are mostly soil, you can actually break them up and rake them over your lawn and use them basically as a top dressing compost. If they're mostly thatch, 
then it's better just to remove the plugs and put them to the compost pile. So benefits of airification helps reduce compaction if that's a problem. It allows better air movement into your soil so the roots that need air to operate properly can get that air. Also allows for better absorption of the fertilizer because the, the roots are where the fertilizer is absorbed. <clears throat> Water is able to be used more efficiently because it will soak into your soil better and faster than if you have a compacted soil where the water just runs off. A healthier turf is better for pest resistance. And aerification is probably the fastest way to get thatch broken down where you've got thatch in place because the microorganisms in the soil that use the thatch as a food source, they are ones that also need oxygen. And so by getting air into the soil, that allows those microbes to break down the thatch faster. So that's why the core aerification will get you results much faster. So here's a lawn before and after aerification, and you can see it makes quite a big difference. The lawn was compacted beforehand, so reducing that compaction allowed that turf grass to recover because the roots were much healthier and they were able to bring more nutrients and water for the grass to grow. Now, talk a little bit about plant pests. The best defense against weeds is a healthy turf. And if you identify the weed, it may tell you why it's growing instead of your grass. I'm going to go through these fairly fast because we're just about done with our time. But if possible, identify what the weed is because there may be some cultural controls that you may be able to use and not have to even rely on herbicides to allow the grass to grow better than the weeds and outcompete the weeds. So moss is one a lot of people ask about. There are many species of moss. Moss has many situations that may encourage it. If you have a wet soil, if you have a lot of shade where the grasses can't get enough sunlight, if your pH is very low, if you have low fertility, or if you have compacted areas, any or all of these conditions can contribute to moss being favored over turf grass. Red sorrel or sheep sorrel is one that's got sort of arrowhead shaped leaves. It's often a sign of low fertility. And it's also a sign of low pH, especially here in New England. And so if you see red sorrel, it's good time to get a soil test or at least at minimum a pH test. White clover, if you don't want it in your lawn, it often is a sign that you've got the beginning of compaction going on and that you may not be fertilizing your lawn enough. Common plantain is one that you will often see in areas where compaction has occurred. And so if you see a lot of this weed growing on, it's probably a good time to consider aerification to reduce the compaction of your soil. Now, if you decide you need herbicides, you want to use a pre-emergent if you want to prevent seedling emergence. It's used to control grassy weeds like crabgrass usually done in the spring. Post-emergent is used to kill weeds after the weedy plants have emerged from the soil, and they will control both grassy weeds as well as broadleaf weeds. The broadleaf weeds example of Creeping Charlie is in the lower right photograph. Always follow the label directions. Not all herbicides can be used on all turf grasses, so you do need to be careful about which herbicides you select based on the grasses you have growing in your lawn. For insects, you wanna plant a diversity of grasses, you wanna plant resistant species and use insecticides that are labeled for your location and the insect pest as a last resort. The cooperative extension site has a lot of information on weed management, on insect management, as well as disease management that I'll mention briefly. If you see a lot of these worm-like structures in the ground, they're grubs. And grubs are the immature forms or larvae of many different kinds of beetles. And the larvae will chew away at your grass roots. And one way you can tell if you've got a grub problem is if you can pull your turf back like it's a rug, then it's probably got too many grubs growing in it. Another 
bug you might see is a chinch bug. It starts out as tiny little red specks and they have many stages of growth in these little red stages until they form an adult like you see here. They will often appear on the hot, dry, sunny areas of your lawn. Now that's on a grass blade. So they're very, very tiny. It's very difficult to see them just when you're standing up above your lawn. But if you have a lot of them on your lawn, it will literally look like your lawn is moving. Aphids are another kind of tiny insect that occasionally appears on lawns. They actually give birth to live young, so they can reproduce very rapidly. And they often are found in the shady parts of your lawn first. As far as disease management, plant a diversity of grasses. There may be some resistant grass species if you've been having trouble with certain diseases regularly. Adjust your pH so that it favors turf grass growth. And use the proper amount of fertilizer. Too little fertilizer or too much fertilizer may promote some diseases. So it, you want the amount that's just right. Also water early in the morning so you don't have wet grass going into the night. And consider raising the mowing height so that your grass has a little bit more leaf blade to produce some chemicals that some of them produce to ward off diseases. In home lawns, you very rarely ever need to use a fungicide. So they generally are not used on home lawns. Real briefly, some of the diseases you may run into are gray snow mold in the springtime as the snow is melting. And what you wanna do is if you've had that a problem in the past, try not piling snow in areas where you've seen it before. Remove tree leaves from the turf. They will help support that disease over the winter. And if you see matted areas in the spring, rake them up and that will break up that disease material and then it will go dormant in the summertime. Two grasses that tend to get snow mold more frequently than others are perennial ryegrass and tall fescue. Dollar spot is occasionally seen on home lawns. It's generally where you've got low nitrogen and it can occur in drought stresses and from night watering. If you have a lawn that's got a lot of dew on it, um, sometimes just dragging a hose across it can break up that dew and help the grass dry off faster. So you have less chance of the dollar spot developing. While Kentucky bluegrass is generally more susceptible, some cultivars are resistant. So if you've seen dollar spot as a problem, generally or definitely look for resistant types and tall fescue tends to be quite resistant to dollar spot. Brown patch you may run into if you over fertilize and if we get high heat in the summertime. And again, breaking up the dew helps. Make sure you don't water too late. And in this case, perennial ryegrass and tall fescue are the ones that tend to be more susceptible to this disease. Red thread and pink patch are associated with low fertility. It literally looks like these red threads are growing out of your grass. So you do wanna add fertilizer to help the grass grow a little bit better, but you don't wanna over fertilize it because then you'll be promoting things like brown patch. And the difference between red thread and pink patch is just the appearance on the leaves. Sometimes it looks like your turf is melting out and you may find spots on the leaves. Various different diseases can cause this. What you wanna do is avoid too much nitrogen in the spring and avoid certain types of Kentucky bluegrasses that are susceptible. Rust diseases can make your lawn look horrific and oftentimes they're a sign that you're low fertility or you might have some drought stress. It often appears later in the summer, early fall. Um, you can fertilize to help the grass outgrow it. But in most years, it's just something that will go away as you keep mowing. Powdery mildew is one that you often see in the shaded areas. And it can appear where you've got low nitrogen. It's more common on Kentucky bluegrass where it does not get enough sunlight. So one thing to do is you might consider pruning your trees to allow more light in your turf areas. That will also improve the air circulation so your grass blades won't stay wet after a rainfall or irrigation as long. The last one I wanna mention is one a lot of people ask about because it's usually associated with mushrooms they may see growing in their yard. And it's caused by various fungi. And essentially it's not 
generally going to kill your grass. It just looks like you've got these dark green rings growing. If you don't like the appearance of the green rings, you can fertilize with nitrogen. Also, some light applications of iron can mask that green color. You want to thoroughly water those rings because they can dry out. And core aeration can help improve the disruption of that disease to some degree. If you see mushrooms, you can use a rake just to break them off. Also, you might want to mow more frequently so that those green rings aren't quite as noticeable because where the green rings are, that grass will grow faster. Occasionally, fairy ring can kill, but that's not typical. In that case, you would have to reestablish your turf, but usually that's not a problem. Eventually, the, where, the fairy ring reaches a limit and runs into something and that knocks it back out and it's not a problem anymore. Unfortunately, there's no resistant species or cultivars available. I do have an area about sustainable turf care. There is a website with a lot of information on sustainable plant and animal management, not just turf care, that I've got listed here. And if you go to the YouTube site when this is up and available, you can copy down this if you don't have time to do it now. Lawn sustainability does not necessarily mean very low maintenance. Plant selection should be based on the environment and the maintenance level that you desire. And you may want to establish turf grasses under optimal conditions before you start trying to maintain them sustainably. Remember for grasses as with other plants in our landscapes, you want the right plant in the right place at the right function. Also establish and maintain a healthy soil environment. Soil testing can help you do that. The more diverse species in your lawn, the better chance you'll have plants that are resistant to whatever may come and attack it. Preferentially use cultural practices that reduce stress on turf grass growth. Aerify compacted soils is an example of a cultural practice. Also understand your local soil and climatic conditions to know whether or not supplemental water might help. And if available, use biological pest control methods, although there are not a lot that are very useful in turf right now. Just be aware that your yard is part of a large ecosystem and even on moderate slopes, if you maintain a healthy, dense lawn, you should have little to no runoff of stormwater that will get down to your groundwater. If you don't have careful management, everything added to your lawn could end up in the waterways. So keeping your lawn dense and healthy is a good idea. And if you find you've got a dry period coming, allowing your lawn to go dormant in the driest summer months may be the best thing for the grass, especially if it's mostly Kentucky bluegrass and the environment. That being said, I now turn it back over to Kate. That was fantastic. I was ferociously writing most of the time. Um, I'm sorry I went fast. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I think that's a great thing. There was a lot of information in there and I, um, I think everyone will appreciate seeing some of the different um, lawn diseases that that you may see, and um, you know, the, a lot of things that that was said in there um, spurred me to say that we have other um, webinars up that are recorded. One of them uh, that I offered at the beginning of this series is on site assessment, which. We'll hit on a lot of the things Dr. Rumley talked about in terms of knowing your soil, um, you know, knowing how much rainfall you get in a year, knowing what zone you're in, you know, a, a lot of things about our landscape we take for granted. And so I'd encourage you all to learn more and um, check out some of the other offerings we have. If this really whet your appetite to learn more about landscape management, either in a gardening um, sense or just in the broader landscape backyard sense. And if you're interested in sharing your knowledge with the public, you could consider becoming a URI Master Gardener. The application period is actually open now. Um, it will be open until November 1st. We will have a training beginning as we do every year, January 2021. That's a semester long. Here are some images. Um, some of the folks who are having a, a wonderful time learning and um, We'll go to the last slide and then Dr. Rumley, I'm going to um, share some 
awesome questions that we've gotten. And in fact, we'll leave these resources up. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to go to a couple questions. So uh, my colleague, Dr. Bidwell, um, asked if your lawn has highly compacted areas, should you airify more often than just in the fall? We got a couple questions on compaction. Usually, if you do a thorough enough uh, airification once a year, should be good enough. Um, if you find that it's it's really if you can't stick a screwdriver in very easily, then you might consider airifying it more frequently. But once a year, even on a compacted lawn, is probably enough. Unless the whole neighborhood plays only on your yard. <laughs> He's a great guy, so there's a good chance that. That's the truth. Um, another question that we got from a few people is about ants. Um, Josh says, I've noticed ant hills in the drier bare spots of my lawn. Are the ants causing these bare spots or are they attracted to these areas of the lawn specifically? Um, the second part of that question is how do we rid ourselves of ants, small ants and ant hills that are affecting the health of the turf grass? Well, usually ants, don't, at least the ants we have here, thank goodness we don't have the fire ants, at least not yet. Um, unless they smother the turf, they're usually not considered a harmful pest in turf. And I would just knock over the hills and, and rake them back. If they're objectionable and you wanna try something that, okay, it's, it's lethal. I, I don't mean to be an anti-animal person, but if you want to get rid of them, uh, you could even try just boiling water mm. or really, really hot water. Why they're in the drier part, it's probably because it's a little bit easier for them to build their tunnels than if it was really wet. In the, in the wetter areas, it would be harder for them to build their tunnels. That's, that's my semi-educated guess. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were an entomologist, I probably would give a, a much more educated guess. But Makes considering that <laughs> you know, when you have an ant farm, they usually have them in sand. And so it's it's easier for them in the drier parts to build their tunnels. Okay. Um, we have a question from Gina. What might be some considerations, if any, if you have a septic system? And I think she was asking this during your lawn establishment conversation. Are there any different um, considerations if there's a septic system underneath where you're establishing or caring for turf grass? If you've got a septic system or a drain field, especially, um, what I found real early on when I came to Rhode Island is that they had been recommended because tall fescue is known as a drought resistant grass. But the problem is it's drought resistant if it can get deeper water and on a drain field you've got an area where water is intentionally being drained away so you want to avoid the tall fescue if at all possible um, in in that area you want to use something that's that's probably less of a water user so i would i tend to increase the fine fescues they will tolerate less water and because you really don't want to be watering a lot over a drain field or a septic system. Great. Um, I think this is our last question. Um, thank you very much for this presentation from Dennis. Any advice for controlling or preventing moss? And I think I know what you're gonna say to this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, all of those cultural conditions, check and find out if any of those exist because those conditions are favoring the moss over the grass. Now, that being said, there have been situations where people have been successful using a mixture of lemon joy in, in water and just brushing it on the moss like you're scrubbing your floor. And that tends to make the moss unhappy. And Oddly enough, the brand Lemon Joy works better than just your Lemon Generic. I don't know why, other than it's something, something is different in it slightly. It might be a little bit different pH or whatever. That is interesting. Oh, I lied. There's more questions. I saw one pop up, yes. 
Yeah. So, um, so Dennis asked, how can we, um, deal with established weeds once they are, um, already there without using herbicides. And if I may just say that I um, copied a link to our weed identification fact sheet, which actually um, is one of my favorite resources that we have. Yes. I, it, it basically um, tells you if you can identify the weed that you have, that weed is actually an indicator of a, a, a condition that is present on your landscape. So you may have low nitrogen, you may have compaction, you may have thin turf. And in, so instead, like you're saying, Dennis, of just spraying an herbicide to get rid of the weed, it's actually helping you look at what might be causing the um, proliferation of that weed, which we call integrated pest management, one example of that. So I would encourage you all to um, download that fact sheet and even print it for your fridge, maybe. Um, Absolutely. I, I've seen that sheet and it is excellent. And, and I only gave a couple examples because I knew I would run too long if I tried and give everything. But um, there are a few weeds that they come in in cases where your lawn may have gotten stressed and the grass had a patch that died out. Those weeds, um, unfortunately, there may not be a cultural condition that they're favoring over the grass. It may be, you know, the dog killed the grass or the kids ripped up a patch of the grass. In that case, digging out the weed may be an option or you may actually try and if you don't want to use a herbicide, try and cover the weed and until it basically dies itself to death by using up all its food resources and then reseeding into that area. But many of our most common lawn weeds, like Kate said, it's a cultural practice thing that you can change that will favor the turf over the weed. And that tends to be, cost less if you can fix it. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And it's, it's a great, great family, family effort, you know, to go out and aerify the lawn or, you know, fertilize it. <laughs> All together now, yes. So um, my friend Ginny is asking, we have holes in our yard that are the size of bumblebees. Are they nesting there? There are some bees that could be, that do nest in the ground, but there could be other kinds of insects that may be making holes in the ground as well. Um, I don't think we live in an area, I hear cicadas are coming out in some parts of the country, but I don't know that we have them up here. I've never seen them as a problem up here. So that would be the other insect I would think of making holes like that. Mm -hmm. But there, yes, there are some bees that, that do make nests in the ground. Yeah. yeah. I've heard um, some of our colleagues say that there are as many uh, ground nesting bees around here, native bees, as there are um, hive nests. So, um, Ginny, I would recommend trying to take a picture, um, or spending some time out there and seeing if anything's crawling out. There's a good chance you have ground nesting bees and that can be a really wonderful thing for your plants. Um, as long, of course, as you don't step on them. Uh, Susa is asking how to handle dandelions. I would say, uh, look at that weed ID chart to see what's actually causing those to grow. Um, Dr. Rumley, do you have any suggestions there beyond that? Well, one of my cousins just made dandelion wine. Um, dandelions actually were brought to this country as a food source and you can eat all parts of the dandelion. The problem with dandelions being somewhat invasive is that they're one of the few plants that can regenerate from just the root because they can grow buds on their roots, which most plants don't do that. And so unless you can remove the entire root, you may not you know, be able to entirely eliminate it. But I have been seeing an advertisement for this lovely picking tool that's supposed to be good at getting out dandelions. I haven't tried it yet, but I've tried other ones. You know, the more dandelion you can get out of the ground, the better chance you have of, of making it use up its food sources. Or just leave them be, but. Yeah. That's the other option. 
Um, okay, and then Jennifer, I think this is our last question. I have some good grass patches growing around compacted soil and very brown grasses. Should I rake out the thatch and aerate that area and reseed it? If generally, if you've got Kentucky bluegrass and it's at least 50% covered, you might, aerification might be all you need to do. Um, there is always the possibility that if you put down too much seed, you can actually get weaker grass because those plants are all fighting for the same resources. So if it's mostly Kentucky bluegrass, what you wanna look for is, is the leaf tips will have sort of a boat shaped tip and they'll be dull on the underside and they'll have a single line running down the middle of the leaf. Um, I would just try aerifying first. And if you do decide to overseed, do it very lightly. Don't go down with a heavy amount. Literally, I wouldn't expect you to count, but they say roughly on a new seeding, you want about 12 seeds per square inch. So we're not talking about a real, you know, handfuls of seed in a small area. Okay, I lied again. One more question from Ward. Can you speak to micro clover? Is it hype or is it better than Dutch white clover? And then what about endophyte enhanced grasses in the home lawn? Are those a good idea? Endophyte, oh, I was gonna mention them and, and I actually had them on a slide and I think I eliminated that slide for some reason. The micro ones, they're just ones that have smaller leaves. They, it all depends upon the appearance. You know, if, if you don't want the clover to be a dominant one in your lawn, you know, as, as being the only thing people see because the leaves are so big of the, the general white clover that it tends to make the grass leaves less visible, you could use the micro clovers. As far as endophytes, endophytes are beneficial fungi that exist in some grasses and they help deter above ground feeding insects. So they would help deter aphids and the chinch bugs, but they would not deter the grubs. If you can use endophyte enhanced grass, those grasses tend to be a little bit more drought tolerant. And certain ones of the fescues also have some disease resistance in them as well. The big question a lot of people ask is because endophytes are not good for animals, will their dog eating some grass be harmful? They probably will not eat enough for it to make a difference. All right. Well, we have lots to think about. Um, I want to thank Dr. Rumley for taking her Tuesday night to share this information with all of you. Um, and before we go, I just direct your attention to this final slide, which lists a number of um, free resources that we have uh, for homeowners, including a web page where you can find that weed identification fact sheet, the Rhode Island planting calendar, and a number of other Rhode Island specific horticultural and gardening resources. We also have a gardening and environmental hotline at URI in the office that um, I work at on campus. And when we're not in a pandemic, we actually have volunteers answering the phone. Right now, um, while we practice social distancing, we are answering emails. So you can send an email with a photograph of an issue you're dealing with or something you need help identifying to gardener at uri.edu and someone will write back to you within three business days. Um, and then general questions outside of the horticultural realm, we always accept at this phone number here or via email. And I'd invite you all to check out our next webinar, which is on Friday at noon. We will have these webinars uh, this June, every Tuesday at seven and Friday at noon. July and August 2020, we will go to just Fridays at noon and then we'll see where we're at in the fall. I hope you've all found this enlightening um, and motivating. And thank you again, Dr. R, for your time. Thanks all of you for supporting URI and Cooperative Extension. Have a great night.